Michael Smith is Head of Business Programs for Initiatives of Change UK and has been one of the coordinators of global conferences on values in business and the economy held in Coe, Switzerland over the past 10 years. He trained in publishing with moral rearmament in the 1960s and worked as production manager of Himat newspaper in Mumbai, India, and then in the USA. In 1987, Michael became founding co-editor of For a Change magazine in London, a position he then held for 19 years. As a freelance journalist, he has written for all the major UK broadsheet newspapers. His books include Great Company, published just last year, a much commended collection of stories of best practice in business ethics, as well as another volume on business ethics titled Trust and Integrity in the Global Economy. He is also the author of the much translated booklet The Sound of Silence, How to Find Inspiration in the Age of Information. He and his wife Jan live in Wimbledon and they have two grown-up children. Welcome back to the English Hour on ANN Television. It's good to be here. It's good to have you with us. And our guest today is Mike Smith. Mike, thank you for, well, thank you for being here. It's, well, it's great. thank you, William, for inviting me. Well, it's wonderful. We're, I'm very excited about this discussion, which I think will be quite, quite interesting. Business ethics is our first subject, uh, integrity in business. And the second is, is about faith and, and your journey with uh, the organization we know as Initiatives of Change. The third is the issue of ethics in the media, which is enormously important, integrity in the media. Yeah, okay. So, off we go. The issue of ethics in business has come to the forefront of discussion in recent years in the aftermath of the banking collapse which affected millions of people around the world and caused many to question the ethical integrity of businesses and what it means to run a morally accountable business. More recently, the Volkswagen diesel emission scandal, the exploitative work conditions in the UK company Sports Direct, as well as the collapse of British home stores, have shown that the issues surrounding business ethics are still extremely important. It seems almost paradoxical that in a time where consumers scream for natural, ethical and organic products, that global capitalism is experiencing a continued ethical crisis that can only be sorted by a new approach to ethical leadership. So much. Uh, really, thank you very much. I, we, we're going to talk about business ethics and integrity in business. And what a minefield. The world, I always, when, when I think of business ethics in recent years, I think of the, the whole collapse, the banking collapse, and, the, and a lot of the shenanigans that went in, um, the immorality perhaps. But this is in my subjective view of, of these, these immense bonuses some of the bankers were paid. Um, that hasn't been reformed, uh, but what is what is business? What does integrity in business mean to you? I mean, where are you coming from? This is your whole. Well, much of your work is around trust and integrity in the global economy. So, well, William, I think where I'm coming from is that I think that future generations may look back at us and say to themselves. How on earth did we allow a situation to arise in mm. the world where we have these enormous uh, global economic disparities between wealth and poverty in the world. And we, we, we may know some of the statistics, you know, 63 people in the world, the richest 63 people have the same assets as the poorest half of the global population, 3.5 billion people, according to Oxfam. Mm. The top 
1% of the world's wealthiest people uh, have the same assets as the rest of the 99% of the world's population. Mm. And uh, if, if you have assets of, of 600,000 or more, then you are in the world's top 1%. And that puts an awful lot of people who are property owners, for instance, in London, uh, in, into that top bracket. Mm. And it's very salutary. And, and then, of course, we have these enormous disparities in boardroom pay. Um, the, the, uh, the heads of the FTSE 100 companies now paid an average of 5.5 million a year. And the, the, the gross disparities between boardroom pay and the average pay of, of the employees who are working for them. And uh, th this is, th these are the seedbeds of revolution. Mm. And uh, you, you wonder why there hasn't been more revolution. In fact, I heard Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, speaking at one of the conferences I helped to organize in Switzerland in 2013. And he himself said at that time, I wonder that there hasn't been more violence on the streets of European cities, particularly since the banking collapse of 2008. So I think we, we, we really do need to rethink where society is going. And I'm very interested in what Theresa May is saying, the new British Prime Minister, because she's put forward a really radical agenda for business and the economy. She said we need uh, workers' representatives on the boards, as in the German model. Mm -hmm. uh, we need uh, uh, shareholder uh, evaluation of boardroom pay to become mandatory and not just advisory. And she said we need to close the gap between the highest pay and average pay and the lowest pay in, inside organizations. And somebody said if Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, had put this forward, it would have been seen as radical. Mm. But it's coming from a Tory leader, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. it's, so, so, of course, she can make these uh, promises, but then how do you deliver on them? But this is a worldwide phenomena, yeah. and it's a modern phenomena. I mean, we, and obviously in Tsarist Russia, there were the same vast disparities between yeah. rich and poor. Yeah. But, but we haven't seen it in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It's, it's, it's a modern it, it, it is. It's, it's a growing modern phenomena, and it's. Uh, I think it's. Um, uh, you know, I think it's human nature too. And every generation has to rediscover this for themselves. Am I going to be part of the acquisitive society, mm. or am I going to be part of the contributing society, contributing to human welfare and the common good? Mm. And I, I have great hope in the millennial generation. The, the so-called Y generation, those who have grown up, who have reached maturity uh, at the turn of the millennium and who are far, far more uh, socially aware about the way the world is going than, than perhaps some of us of the older generation. And they want to engage with uh, issues like social entrepreneurship yeah. and new economic models in the, wor in the world. Uh, benefit corporations, for instance, which have grown up in California, where, the, where companies are actually mandated uh, by the way they're set up to, to meet the interests of all stakeholders in society and not just the shareholders. Because, yeah, that is the key, isn't it? In the yeah. old-fashioned, yeah. if you go back three or four generations or even two or three generations, there was this concept of the business owner who felt a responsibility not just to the shareholders but to the workers to the, and to the industry itself. So you would have yeah. somebody who would take pride yeah. in what they were doing and would want to put money back into that. And now you have the kind of asset stripper, um, I mean, um, and we've seen it, who, who comes in and, and literally raids pension funds and so yeah. on. Yeah. And because it's legal, yes. it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, there is, there's a lack of ethical standards. It doesn't, we, we do anything that's legal. I know. Uh, and I, you're right. I think the, the, um, the great Victorian uh, uh, sort of paternalistic employers had a very great sense of welfare for their employees and, and created model villages and mm. uh, housing and so on. Uh, continued in India, for instance, by the Tata Corporation. An mm. enormous sense of social responsibility. 
Um, but now you get this situation like with um, the, what, what's happened to the BHS pension fund. Yes. And it's, it, it's, it's shocking. Yes, BHS is this um, the, a the, major, the, major clothing retailer in Britain that's just gone gone down. Gone, gone belly up. Yes. And yeah. uh, we have dear Sir Philip Green. Uh, I call him Three Yachts Green because yes. he has three, three yachts. Mm. And yet the, the uh, pension fund of his former employees in the BHS retail chain mm. are suffering. Mm. Because the, the pension fund just isn't there, mm. or it's been seriously raided. Yeah. And it needs to be addressed, it needs mm. to be dealt with. So we get these, these huge scandals, yeah. and, um, and yet, uh, what is it? I mean, the, what is, we're not, it is a basic so social thing, isn't it? That we are, um, what's legal is acceptable. I mean, yeah. The, the, we need to somehow reform this and, and, and get back into a sense of, of business ethics. Yeah, and uh, what, is, what is legal is not necessarily what is moral. No, clearly. And, and uh, yeah. I think we need to go back to some very fundamental ethical principles. And indeed, we can even go back to the founding father of modern economic thought, Adam Smith, mm. who... Uh, who, who was very clear on the ethical issues at stake in, 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 a, in a market uh, capitalist economy. We all know Adam Smith for his uh, phrase talking about the invisible hand of the market. If we each pursued our own interests, then the common good would also be served, which was one passing reference in, in his book on the wealth of mm -hmm. nations. But 16 years earlier, he wrote the book the theory of moral sentiments when he was professor of moral philosophy at Glasgow University. Mm -hmm. And in that, he spelt out his moral philosophy very clearly. And he talked about um, the impartial spectator, which acts like a demigod within the breast, in his mm -hmm. flowery language of mm -hmm. his day, and the mm -hmm. man within, which acted as the vice regent of the deity. In other words, your conscience. Mm. And he said that if, uh, uh, if in the pursuit of wealth injustice was done, then the impartial spectator changed sides. In other words, stopped approving of what you're doing and started disapproving of what you're doing. So he articulated a very strong sense of social con conscience. And uh, I think we have lost something in the whole... Uh, economic, uh, free market, enterprise, capitalist society by forgetting that part of Adam Smith's moral philosophy. And we need to bring that back again. Mm. Um, so mm. the, the divorce between uh, the wealth of nations and the theory of moral sentiments needs to be brought back together. Brought back together. Now and is, we, we need to remember that. Is wealth immoral? I mean, uh, you talk about the super rich, um, the and we have. I mean, there's, clearly there are certain very immoral practices with regard to international companies who don't pay taxes in in companies in which in in countries in which they trade. Yeah, and we we've seen this, and that um, causes quite a lot of outrage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I don't think wealth in itself is immoral. Right. Uh, so much as the love, the love. You know, the great. Um, St. Paul of Tarsus mm -hmm. famously said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Right. So it's not right. money in itself, but it's the love of money. So wh wh what it, it comes back to, what is your motivation? Mm. Uh, are, are you just pursuing an acquisitive agenda? Mm. And I think this is where Wall Street fell down and where we had this uh, terrible situation with the banking crisis in yes. 2007 and 2008. Uh, with the subprime mortgage market, which was an illusion. Mm. It was fundamentally dishonest. You were trying to package up mortgages into these derivatives in a way that was totally unsustainable because it, all it took was for some people to start defaulting on their mortgages, maybe because they lost their jobs or because they were in divorce or family breakup and they had to move house, and people stopped paying their, um, the interest on their mortgages, let alone the premiums. And, and, uh, and the whole thing 
collapsed like a pack of cards. So it was fundamentally dishonest, but, but it was very much driven by acquisition. So this kind of greed yeah. um, that has... I, the, I mean, we live in a more material society. We, the, the, we, I remember the 60s uh, for all their faults, the, and um, because I was a teenager then, and in the, in the 60s there was this, this great spirit of love and, and alternative approach to yeah, life. Woodstock and all that. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and and yeah. that has, over the years, been beaten out of people and they have, partly because life is more insecure. Yeah. Um, because the world is a more uh, fragile place. Jobs are harder to come by and so on. Yeah. So can you blame people for the, the greater materialism in society? I mean, even education is not necessarily free uh, no, as it was for many s in many not societies. At all, not at all. And people, it, it does create dilemmas because people come out of universities with these huge, huge debts which mm. they then have to pay off. And therefore the incentive is to get into the highest paid job and the, and the job that will give the highest return. Mm. Uh, so I quite understand that. But what I find very interesting about um, uh, the, the, the Wall Street syndrome, if you like, and also this uh, pioneering sort of millennial generation who are much more socially aware, mm. they're becoming to realize that the acquisition of money for its own sake doesn't satisfy. It doesn't satisfy the human soul. Uh, mm. I've been in correspondence with Sam Polk, who was uh, one of the arch wolves of Wall Street, if you like. Mm. Mm. He's just published a wonderful book called For the Love of Money, a memoir. And he tells in it how when he got his bonus for the year of $3.5 million, mm -hmm. he was yes. angry. Yes. He was angry because it wasn't more. And it didn't <laughs> match his peers. And then yeah. he suddenly say, said to himself, my God, where am I at? Why mm. am I like this? What am I trying mm -hmm. to prove? Mm. And he realized that it just wasn't satisfying. Mm. And he eventually resigns, got out of it all, went back to California and set up two startup companies. Uh, uh, one, one called uh, Grocery Ships, which is training uh, people from really impoverished backgrounds, uh, young, young um, mothers, how to buy well and eat well, uh, eat healthily and to save money at the same time. Mm. And then he started a food company, which is packaging uh, healthy foodstuffs for people as, a, as, a, as a, an income-generating social enterprise. Oh, what a man. So he's a really, I think he's one of the interesting examples of, of where people are, ha are rethinking mm. about what is the values basis of society and what are their personal values as well in all this. Well, it's a good point to move on to our second subject, which is your personal values. And um, we could mm -hmm. do that and okay. um, because a lot of ground we have to cover. Yep. So let's, let's move on. Okay. Mike Smith is a member of the global group Initiatives of Change, whose ideology is based upon ethical leadership to develop a culture of moral integrity, compassion, and selfless service. Initiatives of Change believes there is an intimate link between trust and integrity because integrity leads to trust, but a lack of integrity destroys trust. A key part of building trust is people choosing to live with a sense of personal and social conscience in responding to the needs of others. This is an idea that Mike Smith fully believes in. It has inspired him to write several books on the subject which contains stories of ethical business people and social activists who have been inspired by the values and spirit of initiatives of change. Mike, your personal journey, and, and I'm interested by this because uh, everybody has their own, their own faith, their own belief system. Um, you are, well, you, you come from, you are part of initiatives of change, the movement. But tell us about your own, yourself and, and what drives you, what your belief is, what your own... Okay, well, d just to, to go back a bit, just to say about my family history, 
Mm. I, I come from a business family background. My father was a wool textile businessman in the city of Bradford in Yorkshire, which uh, in, the, in, in the previous century, in the 19th, in the, in the 19th century, was the, the, the wool capital of the world, if you like. Right. And my great-grandfather was twice elected the mayor of the city of Bradford. Wow. And yes. uh, he, they ran a family business which eventually employed 1,100 people, manufacturing the finest manufactured wool anywhere in the world. Wow. But the whole thing was taken over in the 1950s and then closed down. So 100 years of business and then it ceased to exist. And I think there was some unfortunate business decision-making uh, in the family business, in my grandfather's generation, which, which, which sort of set in the rot, if you like. Mm. And uh, so it's given me a real interest in the whole issues of, of core motivation and leadership in business and the economy. But I, uh, you see, I, was, I, I, I couldn't join a family business. It didn't exist any longer. I was going to go into the Royal Navy. My father sent me to uh, a naval training college. And in my last year there, I suddenly realized that I was a landlubber. Yes. I didn't want to go into the <laughs> Navy at all. And yes. uh, I, I, I had a bit of a crisis. So my father took me out in his car and he said to me, Mike, we're going to um, have a time of quiet, silent reflection. Mm. And we're going to listen to that good, still, small voice within and see if you get any thoughts. I found this acutely embarrassing, yeah, but I was sufficiently desperate to try anything. Right. So in this time of silent reflection, much to my amazement, I had this very clear thought to tell my father that I had been intrigued by the theatre dramas that had been staged uh, in London uh, at the erstwhile Westminster Theatre, sure. which was owned by... MRA, Moral Rearmament, yeah. as it then was, now yes. known as Initiatives of Change. And I said to my father, I would li really like to learn to be a writer. Right. So my father, to his great credit, took this as absolutely as the word of God to me. And he said, right, you stay on for one more year at school and you do your A-level English literature. I'd done mm. maths and physics up mm, to that mm. point. It seemed a crazy idea, but there were a whole series of circumstances it worked out. And I got my A-level English in, in one year. And uh, then was still the issue, well, what was I going to do with all this? And then my, my parents discovered that um, the, the, there's a residential centre uh, up in Cheshire in the northwest of England where they were asking young people, this was a centre of initiatives of change, and they were asking young people to come up and help to, to erect some buildings, some timber buildings, old mizzen huts, yeah. in the estate for accommodation. And uh, it would be a little bit of hands-on practical work. So I went up, I went with two girlfriends. They really did not like it very much, and I loved it. Yeah. So I said to them, well, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to spend a week at this international center. There was a big conference there, uh, international conference. and. Uh, I sat opposite this guy at lunch one day who I'd never met before, a guy called Patrick. And I'd gathered that he was an Oxford University graduate and he was pretty intelligent. He'd studied politics, philosophy and mm -hmm. economics at Oxford. And he said to me, Mike, he said, how long have you known about all this? And I said, well, I've known about it from my parents because mm. they were involved right since the 1930s. Yeah, uh, the Moriama. Yes, so yes, when it yes. previously, it, yeah. it grew out of mm. the 1930s movement called the Oxford Group. Sure. And my parents had met the Oxford Group just after they were married in 1936. So I knew that this was a factor in their lives. Mm. But so Patrick said, okay, you've known about all this all your life. Have you measured your, the conduct of your living against absolute moral standards. Mm. And he talked about absolute honesty, purity of heart and motive, unselfishness, and love, love mm. for people. Mm. And I was too embarrassed to say, no, I'd never measured my life against those four moral mm. principles. Mm. So I said to him, 
uh, yes, but I could do it a lot better. Yes. Which is my way of saying no. <laughs> so he said, right, he said, you, 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 he said, you go away, think about it. We'll go out in my car in a couple of days' time, and you can tell me everything about your life. And I felt as though I was standing on the top of a diving board. Mm. And I thought, either I jump or I don't jump. Mm. And I knew I had to jump, because if I didn't, I never knew what I might miss in life. <laughs> Remarkable. So I w we went That's out in his car, and he, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. got me to be very honest about the things I'd been getting up to, girls and so on. So, yeah. so absolutely. I mean, obviously, when you're talking about these, and those are the, the ethical principles yeah. uh, that drive you, but uh, they are, of themselves, they're quite tame unless you bite into them. I mean, absolute love. Uh, we can all sit here and love everybody. I can, I can, I can love the dog. I can love the, sure. the guy who's yeah, yeah. on the other yeah. side of the camera. And I can love the world. I and I can be as... But yeah. unless we translate that into love in action, into some sort of compassion, a absolutely. it's meaningless, a absolutely. really. Absolutely. Otherwise, we're sort of saying, I love humanity. It's just people I can't stand. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. But, yeah. but uh, I think they're also a means to an end. They're not the end in themselves. Hmm. And, and, and the end is to, is, to, is to build a new society in the world and mm. a new society of far greater justice in the world. Uh, and so the, 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 uh, the moral virtues, the other, the other factor in the equation is, is to take time in silent reflection every day. Now, this is, this is yes. very interesting because this, yes. I, I, we talked about this before, but <laughs> this is, uh, resonates, I think, with some of our listeners because mm -hmm. um, both in Sunni Islam and in Shiite Islam, mm. you have the practice of Sufism, yeah. which is, in a sense, listening to that inner yeah. voice yeah. or listening to God or, yeah. or being open to God. Yeah. So, and essentially, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you, you go back to Sufi philosopher like Rumi. I've been reading about him. What recently. a wonderful man. Absolutely amazing. Yes. He is astonishing. And, and then incredibly contemporary too. Yes, it? yes. And most, of, yeah. uh, and most of our listeners will assume, because he w wrote in Farsi, that he was Shiite. He's actually Sunni, yeah. uh, curiously enough. Yeah. Uh, but a remarkable man. I mean, what a remark! His 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 poetry is yeah. breathtaking. Yeah, absolutely. And and it covers everything. He's, he yeah. even has the most astonishing and astounding love poetry. That's so beautiful. He, he does. And and mm. and I've read the the novel by the Turkish author called The Forty Rules of Love. Oh yes, which, which is all about Rumi too. Yes, you know, yes. Which, is, which again is fascinating. So so I think um, for all our different faith traditions whether you call it in the Gandhian philosophy the inner voice mm -hmm. or, or in the Islamic philosophy the voice of conscience or the, or the Judeo-Christian philosophy of the still small voice within, to, me, to my mind it's all the same. Right. And we've, you have that ability to tune in to that, that voice of conscience, that voice of reason, that voice of inspiration. I wrote a little booklet uh, called The Sound of Silence. Mm. It's a website now, soundofsilence.org. Mm. But in it, I, I wrote that in the age of information, real inspiration comes in times of silent reflection. So this, um, uh, this practice you, is something you practice daily then, yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, I do, and I do it. I try to do it first thing every morning when I wake up. Mm on the grounds that uh, it helps you to get on top of the day before the day gets on top of you. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, do it before you start checking your emails, before the phone starts ringing. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and then you have a sense of preparation and going into the day. Hmm. And it may be just very mundane thoughts about, you know, an email to send or somebody to be in touch with or something. And then sometimes you just get a sense of, uh, an inner insight or an inspiration to be in touch with somebody about something that you hadn't thought of before. And this is actually, to be honest, it could be uh, the people of all religions and none. Because Absolutely. Because it, it is not, I mean, that, that inner voice that you s referred to your conscience yeah. at one point yeah. uh, when you were talking about Adam Smith. Yeah. Um, that is there. Everybody has a sense of natural justice. Yeah. And, and that... that and everybody knows. We all know what's right and wrong. I mean, there's nobody that doesn't really, yeah. um, yeah. uh, unless you're 
a sociopath or something, but anybody yeah. who's, everybody in this world knows what's right and what's wrong and, and then you And then, you, and then you, you, you look at it in the context of your life's journey and what are the issues in the world that need addressing and mm. what role can I play? And another big turning point took place in my life in the late 1960s when Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, one of the grandsons of Mahatma Gandhi, yes. brought a, a visiting troupe of young, young people from India and Asia to the International Center of Initiatives of Change in Co in Switzerland. And while he was there, he appealed for young people from Europe to come and serve in his country. He said, my country, India, is developing economically under a democratic system at a time when China is developing under a totalitarian system. But the fundamental thing is, he said, we've got to deal with the issues of corruption, communalism, so key. ethnic yeah. tensions yeah. and so on, and help to build, us, help, help to build a, a, a nation that really works and come and serve in our country. Don't come in an imperialistic fashion. And this was, remember, this was only about 20 years after independence. And uh, I, I was almost on the next flight. I was so inspired to, you know, to have, a, have a part in doing something like that. Mm. My family had no family history in India. We, we, were, we were not imperialists in that sense. Mm. But I thought, my gosh, this is something I would really like to get engaged in. Mm. So in 1971, I was invited to go and work on Raj Mahan Gandhi's newspaper in Mumbai. Yes. And I went for one year and I stayed for three. Wonderful. Yeah, Wonderful. And I absolutely loved it. I've been back many, many times to India since then. Gosh, well, that maybe isn't... Um, a good point to go on to our next subject, which is ethics in media, yep. you know, because we, we need to cover that. Yeah. So we'll do that. Good. Journalists have seen an increasing amount of pressure from both government and the general public to act in a morally responsible way. In the UK, we have had the recent News of the World newspaper phone hacking scandal. On the back of this, the Leveson Inquiry was launched, headed by Lord Justice Leveson, which was set up to examine the culture, practices, and ethics of the press in Britain, and in particular, the relationship of the press with the public, police, and politicians. The ideas that Mike Smith discusses in his books relate directly to the media who should act to hold business people, politicians, and indeed, everyone to account to ensure the values of trust and integrity are maintained by all sectors of society. So, uh, media ethics, Mike. I mean, yeah. um, ah, the media. And, th and there, you, you were talking earlier about ab absolute honesty. Yeah. That's a situation where box-ticking honesty is not good enough because, no. because if you're a journalist, I mean, most journalists, with their hands on their hearts, could say, I'm honest. Mm. But that doesn't mean that they're conducting their work in a spirit of fair play, mm. uh, being even. They may be, their, their honesty may be box sticking, uh, mm. and they may be actually not lying, mm. but they may be selecting facts. They yeah. may be, uh, and, and the, what we need in journalism and in broadcasting is a spirit of integrity, really, that, that goes, that's one step above Absolutely. honesty. Itself. Absolutely. And, and, and let's get be clear about one thing to start with. The fourth estate, as the, as the media is called, mm. is one of the most influential forces in the world. Yes. Uh, the, the broadcast media as well as the print media. And I think the fourth estate does an honorable service in the world, and we should really acknowledge that from the start. It's thanks to the, to the global media that we are the most informed generation in history. We know what is going on in the world. And some of the best journalism uh, recognizes that and honors that. And, it's a, and it can be a tremendous sort of yes. source of encouragement and hope. I mean, mm -hmm. we in Britain have been hugely inspired by the Olympic Games in Rio, which has been brought to us by, by the broadcast media. And uh, 
we've actually done rather well in the, mm, the Olympic mm, Games, the yes, Great, Great Britain. Yes, but yes. Uh, there are downsides, of course. And I think there's a huge difference between um, the tabloid media and the quality broadsheet journalism. And on the whole, the quality broadsheet journalism is, is run on a very ethical basis. And some of the tabloid press is mm. dubious in the extreme. Mm, mm. And I think the reading public just has to recognize this and take the tabloid be media with a huge pinch of salt mm. and say, OK, that's a load of fun, but we don't have to believe half of what we read in it. And then, and then occasionally there are very serious slip-ups. And I think uh, the BBC and the police's invasion, for instance, of the pop singer Cliff Richard and his home, right, uh, on, on, at, at a time when the, the police had sort of suspicions, as had, he, had he been involved in, 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 in molesting back in a, some music concert in the 1980s. There was no, no evidence whatsoever that stood up. And to broadcast it, uh, in, in a way that immediately threw suspicion on him was totally unconscionable. Mm. And the police were at fault and the, and, and the BBC was at fault and I think he's doing absolutely right to sue them. So what you're saying, I mean, this is a uniquely British story, but I mean, yeah. many people will know the, the, the pop singer Cliff Richard and, yeah. and uh, worldwide. So um, he was investigated and the investigation proved groundless. Yeah, and he was totally exonerated. Yeah. 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 But what you're saying is that journalists should restrain themselves from um, throwing mud and, unless, there's, unless there's proof. Uh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm all for journalists being whistleblowers and to expose what is wrong. And I think they do, you know, some of the insight investigations are really, really excellent. I mean, the whole story of, uh, of exposing the thalinamide drug for instance, mm, mm. which was conducted by the Sunday Times Insight team. Uh, over a period of something like four years, they investigated it and then proved that, uh, that pregnant mums who were taking this drug for morning sickness was leading to, to uh, the birth of severely um, deformed babies. Absolutely uh, tragic. And the, the media exposed that. Mm. And that was really, really good whistleblowing. But the, the journalists need to be whistleblowers on themselves first. If, they're going to, if you're going to whistleblow on society, whistleblow on your own conduct first. But there is an issue there. I mean, just to, because it's an interesting point. We'll go back to the main issue of media ethics in a moment. Yeah. But the issue of whistleblowing. Yeah. I mean, you're, I, I believe you're quite close to some people in Transparency International. Yeah. Uh, now, they have had in many instances, and I know of one particular one, I'm not going to cite the instance, but the whistleblower themselves have a corrupt agenda. In other words, they'll be, and we've seen this, we see this in, uh, and sometimes a political agenda. Yeah. We've seen, and we've seen this uh, in Ukraine, for example, uh -huh. um, just to take a case. I, I mentioned, I cite Ukraine. I can cite that more easily. I cite Ukraine because I was at a conference with some, Ukrainians actually run by initiatives of change, and they were talking about media ethics. Yeah. Um, and in some, it's a hugely political issue there. Yeah. Because you want to expose corruption. Yeah. But you may have your own very political motive yes. because you want to expose the corruption yes. in your opponent. Yes. You may have your own corruption. It, so there is a whole. It, it's, ter it's terribly, and, and you use a corrupt means yes. in order to expose somebody else's corruption. Yes, yes. And that's terrible. But let me tell you about a media conference I went to in Sarajevo in the year 2000. Oh, yes, the International, I, International Commu Communications, Communications Forum. Forum. Yes, which I'm Very, now very in. short after the Balkans war yeah. and we were invited there by a Muslim broadcast journalist called Senad Kamenicha mm. and he said that he was incensed by the role that the media had played in whipping up ethnic tensions in the Balkans and he quoted one Croat journalist who'd said to him I am quite prepared to lie in my articles for our side. Mm. 
and he was absolutely disgusted by this. It could have been, I mean, that happened to be a Croat. It could have been a Serb. It could have been a Bosnian saying that. So he called together this conference in Sarajevo where about 70 or 80 journalists got together from around the world. And we, we saw the bombed out buildings there. We saw the bombed out building of Oslobodzenia, which was the famous newspaper, mm. which was a multi-ethnic run newspaper with journalists from all the different ethnic backgrounds working mm. together very, very courageously, very heroically. And um, I, I, it just brought home to me how journalism can be far too easily corrupted uh, in, in taking sides without, without retaining that sense of objectivity. So I come back to this issue of turning the searchlight, in, searchlight inwards and um, being honest, absolutely honest ourselves as journalists. I remember I submitted an article to the Financial Times at one point. It was on business ethics. Mm. And I inserted a word into a quote from a German businessman mm. in order to clarify what he was saying. Mm. And I inserted the word ethical mm. into his quote. And I sent it off to the editor of that particular section of the newspaper. And I thought afterwards, that's all very well, but I'm not being very ethical myself. Mm. I'm misquoting this guy. Yes. I don't have his permission to quote him that way. Mm. So very sheepishly, I phoned up the editor of the, that particular page and I said to him, look, Tim, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to correct this quote. He didn't actually say the word ethical and I've put it in and I'm not being ethical myself. Can you delete the word, please? Yeah. And I felt a, a complete idiot. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, fine, OK, yeah, we better, we better be uh, accurate then. Thanks for telling me. And that was it. Yeah. You know, so I, I just had to eat humble pie. But, but, I, but the point was, I have to live with my conscience as a journalist. Mm, you know, mm, and, uh, and, and do the right thing. But there are huge issues, aren't there, of media? I, I, um, I mean, we have journalists are under enormous pressures now. Uh, they're under pressures from their own establishment. They're under pressures from society. Uh, they're under pressures from their peers. And it gets very hard if you're talking about war reporting and so on, where journalists are often embedded yeah. these days yeah. with uh, troops. They're fed lines. And we saw this. Um, we have seen this. Uh, in regard to Iraq, for example, just to take, I mean, uh, hmm. the, the, the lines that journalists have absorbed from the security services in the run-up to the Iraq war hmm. and during the, after the fall of Saddam hmm. uh, in the aftermath. And they've been almost willingly hoodwinked. Hmm. And, and, and this continues up to hmm. a point. Hmm. There, there is a... Um, where journalists will talk about the liberation of uh, towns like Kobani or Fallujah. Mm. Um, and there's little, very little reporting on what's happened to mm. what, I mean, mm. there's so little of those towns. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean yeah. the, so we, we spin all the time because we want to be um, somehow supporting... Supporting the team. We yeah. want to be on side. Sure. Sure. We want to support our team. And, and well, it's, I, it's quite an interesting point, and you know far more than I do, because I've never mm. reported in the Middle East or mm. anything like that. I've mm. never been in a war situation. I have been on a platform with Martin Bell, the BBC war correspondent. Yes, yeah, reported, wonderful man. Wonderful man, reported throughout the Balkans conflict. Mm. And he was very clear, because he, he and I went to speak to journalism students at Lincoln University. Mm. And he said, you have to be very clear where truth lies. And sometimes you have to be, you put yourself in harm's way, as he said, because that, that's the title of one of his books. But he also said, you have to decide where truth lies. And if truth lies on one side and not on the other side, you have to be prepared to take sides. Mm. Uh, I, I found that really quite interesting. But, but he said, you have to decide for yourself where the truth lies. Mm. You know. So, so that, that's quite a difficult situation. The whole other issue, of course, is 
is, is, is the images that, that are broadcast. Yes. And we've had this terribly, terribly mm. emotive and terribly sad picture of this little five-year-old boy sitting in the back of an ambulance. This is in Aleppo in yeah, Syria. In Aleppo. Yes. Caked in dust, caked in blood on his face, looking totally dazed. And that image has brought home to the world like nothing else what it is like to be in a war zone. And, 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 and great credit to, to the cameraman who filmed that mm. and captured that image for the world. That terribly, terribly shocking, sad image. And we just heard that uh, the little boy's older brother has died in that bombing. Mm. And you say to yourself, my God, the military and their political masters should really hang their heads in shame. Mm. Of what is going on in a, in a city like Aleppo. What you then do about it, I don't know. Well, it's but I think that image was, you know, we talk about a picture worth a thousand words. I think that was worth several thousand words. You know? I think the uh, international community have, well, it's a whole other issue, but uh, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of responsibility that lies on the backs of us all. I mean, I do hope that we will have, before um, Obama goes, we'll have one last big push at peace in Syria. Um, yep. I, I, there, I think there is some energy for that. Um, and uh, and I, I hope and pray, I think we should all pray, that that'll take place because mm -hmm. otherwise we have to wait again for why do we always depend on the United States but we do have to wait for a new president to be elected and then we have to wait for them to get their boots on yeah. and sort of find their feet yeah. and um, um, but uh, yeah we have to wait on the United States because the United States can put pressure on the players if it chooses to and, I, and, mm. and, and, and who knows I mean some of the most intractable problems in the world mm. May, may turn on a dime. You just never know what's going to happen. Given the right leadership, Absolutely. who anticipated, and this was another wonderful media story, mm. uh, the, the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989. No, no. Who, who could possibly have seen how quickly well. that took place? Yeah, and or the, or the, the, the Northern Ireland Agreement. It may the have taken Northern long. Ireland Agreement and, and, then, the, and the release of Nelson Mandela yeah, and, the, and then coming to yeah. power in South Africa. And very often we yeah. forget the real heroes in this because the release of Nel Nelson Mandela, yeah. but it was the, the South African president who had to do that and who yes. had to then sell. Yeah, de Klerk. That, yes, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and, and he's sort of in a, in a by road of history, but, but he, he really was... Um, the, 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 absolutely. the giant in that situation. So I think we need some real heroic leadership in the Middle East yes, now, in, yes. in these situations. Really heroic leadership. Mm. And, 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 and leadership that really looks at the, the common interests of everyone and not just spheres of influence. You know. mm. Interesting. Well, yeah. there, let me, because we, while we while we got you, the, you have written two books and, it, and I just yep. would like to I mean, we'll um, come back, but I'd like to refer to them. Mm -hmm. um, the one, the year earlier of the two, well, you've written more than two because you've written The, the Sound of Silence. What was it? The, uh, yes, The Sound of Silence, which yes. is a booklet, yes, yeah. which you can get online. Well, now this one, uh, Trust and Integrity in the Global Economy, um, which is published by Better Yourself Books. and That's it, actually published in India. It was first published by Initiatives of Change in the UK. Right. And then, uh, then uh, better, the, the, the um, St. Paul uh, Press in India, their imprint, wanted to publish it in okay. India. Okay. And, and well, um, it's basically each chapter is a separate story of, of entrepreneurs who are doing the right thing. It's a series of case studies, basically, from around the world of entrepreneurs who are trying to do the right thing. And a lot of these stories have emerged from the conferences right. that we've had on this theme of trust and integrity in the global economy. Because you run big conferences one in, uh, once a year in Switzerland, in, in Switzerland and, yeah. and once a year in, I in, mean, you yourself run yeah, that's the, right. the yeah. trust and integrity. In, in the global economy yeah. in Switzerland, in um, the International Center of Initiatives of Change in, in the Alpine village of Co. Uh, Yes. C-A-U-X. Right. In, in near Montreux. 
And then every second year, we have an international conference in uh, Panchgani in India, in Western India. Right. Not in the, in the mountains, not far from Pune. Yes, uh, yes. And we get a lot of business leaders from Indian corporations coming there to look at ethical practice in well, business in, in the Asian context. Well, this is interesting because, and, and the, this is available online. And just for our listeners, there is, you have more recently, yes. you have another book, yeah. uh, Great Company um, by Michael Smith. Again, talking about trust and integrity uh, and the, in the global economy. Um, and this, uh, this one is indeed published by Initiatives of Change, but this is a, um, a very interesting I, book. I think it's, it's a more up-to-date book of the two. Right. And it's probably a little bit better thought, thought out. Right, so this is the one, <laughs> if anybody wants to read one, this is the one to read. This is the one to read. Yeah, okay. I, I think because I, ta yeah. I tackle various different subjects, Excellent. Uh, chapter by chapter. So I, I tackle uh, the stance against corruption in yes. one chapter, I tackle social entrepreneurship. Uh, I tackle the environmental challenge right. in various different chapters. Um, so, um, well, excellent. So, in great company, yeah. uh, or great company, or in great company? No, no but in great uh, company. Just great company. Great company with a, dibble, uh, a deliberate double entendre. <laughs> Absolutely. Be because the, you, I, I get to meet all these uh, wonderful business leaders yes. from all around the world, and I find that they are. Great company. Yeah, absolutely. They're great company to be with yeah. and to get to know. Well, so, excellent. Uh, so this is published and uh, by uh, Initiatives of Change. It is, And yes. is available online, yeah. uh, published in 2015, published last year. Published last year. And I'm, I'm getting, mm. next year I'll do a, a, another edition of this. I'll great. update it with more stories. Well, bless you. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, and thank you for... Being our guest on ANN Television, it's been a real privilege to have you with us. Well, it's been a great joy and privilege to, to talk with you, William. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Great. Bless your heart. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. So. Well, what have we learnt and where are we going with this subject? It is such a massive issue, the whole issue of integrity, the whole issue of trust. Um, I sometimes think, I, I wonder whether there, there's a need for us all to find a word for our, that covers our personal behaviour when we work in business. Maybe sincerity is the word. If we act with sincerity, uh, we are being true to ourselves and true to others, perhaps. But, but certainly the whole issue of integrity is, is hugely important and integrity in the media is vastly important. Uh, we have to change. We have to change. Each one of us has to change. Uh, we're talking about initiatives of change. They, they have very much the concept of change begins with ourselves. And it doesn't matter whether we're journalists or businessmen or, or just private individuals. Uh, we all have a responsibility to exercise integrity in terms of our relationships with others. And hopefully we do so. God bless you. Thank you for being with us on ANN Television. And thank you for being our guests this time.